Hello wrestling fans. Welcome back to the $20 million Pro Wrestle Machine Studio and welcome back to the show. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine. August 25th, 1997 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. Plum Marco dies after match, WCW adding two-hour show on Thursdays, more. By Observer staff. When you actually think about all the risks wrestlers take in the ring, the injuries that do happen and the accidents that can happen, it's actually almost an unbelievable statistic when it comes to the mortality rate in the profession from in-ring injuries. The death of Japanese woman wrestler Plum Mariko, real name Mariko Umeda, on August 16th stemming from an in-ring accident in a match the night before was actually the first death stemming from an incident inside the ring in the history of pro wrestling in Japan. It is the first death stemming from an incident in the ring at least in a major promotion since the Mexican wrestler Oro passed away on October 26, 1993 of a brain aneurysm suffered after taking a routine bump off a chop in the middle of a match. While there have been a few heart attack deaths in the locker room after a match over the past several decades, with names like Larry Cameron, Killer Mal Kirk, who I believe actually died of his heart attack in the ring, Ray Gunkel, Luis Hernandez, Jay Youngblood and Mike DiBiase coming to mind deaths from actual in-ring injuries are astonishingly rare. This is not to lessen the tragedy when such a rare occurrence does take place, particularly in a case where many in hindsight seem to feel it was preventable. Marco, 29, was working a tag match on the JWP card on August 15 at the Hiroshima Astel Plaza teaming with Boyashoi Kid against Mayumi Ozaki and Rieko Amano. Ozaki delivered Liger Bomb on Marco, who landed higher on her back and on the back of her head, which is not unusual for such a powerbomb landing, but what was rare was she was knocked completely out and the match had to be ended at that point. She never woke up again, and was rushed to the hospital in an ambulance for an emergency brain operation that night. She officially died at 6.25 p.m. the next day, with the cause of death believed to have been from an abscess in the brain and a fractured skull, a condition she may have gone into the ring with since she had been complaining of for some time and company officials after the fact admitted she had been unusually tired as well of late although she had refused to miss any matches. The belief is the injury was the final blow in a cumulative group of injuries resulting in brain trauma such as repeated moves such as pile drivers, suplexes landing on the back and head and power bombs as opposed to a singular injury during her career. The death has resulted in a lot of introspection within the Japanese wrestling world both from inside and outside. There are questions, both from the amount of punishment that the women pro wrestlers with their smaller size and frames, and for that matter even the men, are expected to endure, combined with the fact that Japanese wrestling isn't regulated. In fact, despite the physical nature of most of the major offices, only New Japan Pro Wrestling has a doctor it shows who checks out the wrestlers before putting them in the ring and can administer to them in case of an accident. Since this story is a major mainstream media story in Japan, there has become a lot of talk about some form of regulation of wrestling such as the commission system in some states in the United States, although most commissions when it comes to governing the actions and safeguarding the participants within pro wrestling are a joke and of mandating a doctor at ringside both for immediate attention to injuries and for checking out participants ahead of time. Mariko, who had suffered numerous serious injuries over the past three years wrestling a style not really designed to allow for long careers, was wrestling despite numerous concussions that made it impossible for her to remember complicated finishes and thus kept her out of the main events, and despite having what after the fact became known that she was working with tremendous head pain in recent weeks but continued to wrestle because that's the mentality within the Japanese wrestling world. The police in Hiroshima wanted to investigate the death but her parents asked them not to do so because she loved pro wrestling and it was her decision to continue on despite suffering constant injuries. Mariko's death came just one day before the 11th year anniversary of her pro wrestling debut which was on the inaugural card of the first JWP promotion on August 17, 1986 at Karakuen Hall. Her debut was the same night as the pro debut of Dynamite Kansai, Ozaki, Shinobu Gundori, Harley Saito and Rumi Kazama among others with the formation of the group that originally was considered opposition to all Japan women forming in the wake of a peak in women's wrestling popularity from the Crush Gals. JWP had scheduled two Karakuen Hall shows on August 17, an afternoon and evening show as the anniversary of both the start of the promotion but also of the debuts of Kansai, Ozaki, and Mariko, but the shows turned out to be more tragic than celebratory. At the show, they held a 10-count memorial announcing her death, her funeral took place on August 19 in Tokyo. All the women from the initial JWP wrestling class, which also included Cuddy Suzuki and Eagle Sawai, were trained by former New Japan wrestler Kotetsu Yamamoto, at the time between stints working for that company in the front office, Atsushi Onita and Gran Hamada, the latter two of whom were unemployed as pro wrestlers during that time period. 
that first JWP folded five years later, and basically splintered into two different promotions, one of which is today's LLPW, and the other being the second incarnation of JWP which restarted in 1992. During her career she held both the JWP and UWA Junior Championships, and during the early 90s was considered a second-tier star with the group and a good undercard worker with a submission expert gimmick. With her training in Samba the shooter gimmick was based in reality as despite her small size, 5'2", 132 pounds, and pretty looks, she was at one point considered the policewoman in JWP outside the ring to protect Ozaki and mainly Cutie Suzuki outside the ring as they hung out together publicly. Suzuki at the time was the big draw for the company for her early run as something of a mainstream popular picture book model who eventually did what would be considered softcore porn videos. She suffered several major injuries that kept her out of action for long periods of time before coming back to the ring on October 13, 1996, although she didn't get any kind of a push on her most recent comeback. Her first major injury was on April 10, 1994 in a match at Karakuen Hall against Hikari Fukuoka, where she suffered a broken nose and broken left collarbone and was out of action for 16 months. Shortly after her return, on December 9, 1995, she broke her right collarbone and was out another 10 months. Her most recent return was on JWP's biggest show of 1996 at Sumo Hall, and blew an important spot in the match which ended her chance of getting a push. She worked only on and off since that point without any kind of a push, with reports being that she was unable to memorize the complicated series of spots worked in matches within the current style. When the Japanese women wrestlers were taking the standard of pro wrestling to the next level that many of the top male workers have reached since that time, during the 1992-1994 period, there was some discussion behind the scenes and even articles written in Japan about the potential of a death or major injury because of all the high-risk moves particularly the alarming frequency in which women wrestlers suffered injuries serious enough in the ring that it was commonplace for them to have to be carried out of the ring after a match because of an inability to leave under their own power. It became a non-issue publicly over the past three years because nothing as serious as was feared ever occurred. While this was the first death from a ring injury from a match in Japanese wrestling history, in the past decade there had been two other deaths of trainees who had never had a professional match in the dojos, one with New Japan of a national champion amateur under circumstances so suspicious that it was largely responsible for Hiroshi Hase, the mentor of the young wrestler, leaving the company, and the other in the dojo of the old UWF. World Championship Wrestling is expected to officially announce shortly the addition of a second two-hour weekly live television show starting at 8 p.m. on Thursday nights with a kickoff date planned for January on TBS. The show had been in the talking stages for months. At one point it appeared to have been a definite, as TBS, in its own ratings war with USA, Nickelodeon and sister station TNT for the top spot in cable, one of the kind of weekly boost TNT has gotten from its wrestling show. With the money figure offered by TBS for the show, believed to be about $12 million for the year, substantial enough to ensure the company is being easily and majorly profitable despite its huge talent costs, which likely will be increasing, at first it appeared to be an easy decision. However, many in WCW feared the new show in a big way, both from a personal standpoint because of the increase in workload, and the fear of television overexposure prematurely ending the current boom period and talent morale problems from adding 52 more dates per year on the road. Nevertheless, when WCW drew a strong 3.8 rating off its traditional Monday night on July 22nd, and followed it up with a 4.34 on August 4th, the betting line was that the company would be dragged by the network, kicking and screaming if it had to, into adding the second show. A memo was sent internally to WCW officials on August 13th about the second show, although Eric Bischoff was telling people, perhaps in an attempt to come off as the good guy in a situation that wouldn't be taken well, that he was going to resist doing the show unless it was specifically ordered by Ted Turner. However, high-level internal meetings were scheduled in how to put together the new show on August 19th in Atlanta. TBS may change its weekend four hours of taped wrestling programming schedule although no change will be made in the Saturday night show. The belief, stemming from statements Bischoff made on Nitro and other bits and pieces we picked up is that one of the two weekly shows would become more NWO-oriented with Bischoff as the host, and the other more WCW-oriented in that they try to portray the two groups even more as two entirely different promotions that are feuding, and have the pay-per-view and arena shows become more interpromotional in focus. Of course this brings up the obvious overexposure question. Thus far in expansions, from WCW expanding Nitro to 2 hours, followed by WWF expanding Raw to 2 hours, it has only resulted in more fans watching wrestling on cable than in many years. There is an oversaturation point as wrestling history has shown, 
both in the 50s and again in the late 80s and early 90s where television has fueled a boom period and then within a few years gobbled it up and left the scrap struggling for financial survival. Even with all the new programming, there is still far less wrestling available on television in most markets than in the mid-80s when so many regional promotions had syndication before they went under one by one. As has been historically the case with wrestling every boom period, more television is added until it chokes itself through decreased ratings, but at the same time, right now there is no evidence whatsoever based on falling ratings if anything the opposite looks to be the case, that pro wrestling as it stands right now is overexposed. The ability to add another live show without a creative drain on those writing the shows, not to mention the problems because of the top guys rewriting their own storylines, not to mention the physical drain and increased injury rate from the wrestlers who will have to carry the bulk of the time through their ring work is just another item to consider. One would have thought the inauguration of Shane Douglas as the theoretical long-term standard bearer as ECW champion would have been the most memorable part of the company's second pay-per-view show on August 16th from the Fort Lauderdale War Memorial Auditorium. But instead, despite Douglas winning the title in what was generally conceded to have been the best match on the show, the lasting thought on the show was exactly what ECW feared most. The show looked minor league. The wrestling was for the most part okay, although nobody except Sabu came out of the show as breaking out of the pack. But the production lighting look and sound came off more like a Herb Abrams pay-per-view than the alternative to WWF and WCW that ECW attempts to present itself as. The overall reaction to the show was mixed, and really it would be almost impossible not to get some positive reaction to the show considering ECW does have its fan base, which is a fanatical to its product as any fan base for a wrestling promotion in the world. There were many who loved the show. But those who didn't like the show, and that appeared to have been the majority, reacted nearly as vociferously with numerous callers, saying it was the best pay-per-view show of the year, and almost as many others saying it was the worst. The show seemed thrown together in spots, unlike the first ECW pay-per-view show in April which was planned out far in advance and was one of the best shows of the year. Reports were that Request TV didn't get a script until literally the last minute. ECW officials were frantically trying to find surprises during the last week, to the point they were even looking for Jim Duggan's phone number, as it was and they got Jake Roberts and Dory Funk, who were both good for nice pops, but played no part into any real storyline development. Paul Heyman described the card as a good live house show but a terrible pay-per-view television show. Reports from those who attended the show live would concur as among those there it got almost all thumbs ups. The show suffered with an attempt to get creative that fell totally flat in the show Long Sandman Ambulance Ride. Heyman said that the next pay-per-view show, which will be November 30th from Monaca, Pennsylvania, suburban Pittsburgh, would be more like an ECW arena or television shoot with two or three cameras, with more concentration on planning ahead of time and of the show quality itself, and less on making sure not to offend people. Heyman felt he had to be careful when it came to what aired on television since they were under the gun with many cable systems to back up their claim that they were no different than the other wrestling groups on pay-per-view, thus pulling back the camera shots from the blood a la WCW cutting back on the swearing so as not to give whomever his enemies are ammunition to hurt future events and to get over the hump with viewers choice and some of the other companies that to this point are refusing to carry the show. The only swearing came in the first few minutes when Rick Rude said fuck you, Todd Gordon. They even toned down not using phrases like this being the most extreme wrestling in the world and toned down referring to Dreamer as the innovator of violence. Once again several perhaps many ECW fans who are supposedly such loyal pro-company advocates don't have any clue of the big picture with the company trying to tone down slightly in order to be on the right side of some cable company executive's offensive compass, which is also not selling out, but simply trying to conduct business in today's real-world climate rather than some mixed-up fantasy about what hardcore is supposed to mean. Many fans were out there doing crude chants trying to get themselves over and not having clue one about how their actions could potentially affect the pay-per-view future of the company they profess to care so much about, particularly because there is a possibility although unlikely at present but there had been negotiations up until about a month or two ago, for viewers' choice to take over request and VC has yet to approve of running ECW pay-per-view events. If everything in regards to that scenario would go wrong for ECW, and the odds are strongly against it, they could lose pay-per-view exposure. The objections there are to the show, whether valid or not and since it's pay-per-view where you have to make a conscious choice to order the show so really like with UFC, these decisions not to carry the events are really unsettling and kind of scary, have to do with violence and obscenities. But if the people who profess to love the product so much can't figure out the score, they can potentially be the cause of it taking a giant step backwards as well. 
Very early estimates indicate the show did between an 0.20 and 0.23 buy rate, or about 35,000 buys, which would be an estimated 13 to 20% drop from the first show but would also make a profit crudely estimated by those who really don't know the costs of around $90,000. For a second show it held up far better than Pancrase, EFC or UWFI but didn't show the growth momentum of UFC at the same stage, UFC went from about 80,000 buys to 100,000 buys in a significantly larger universe from show 1 to show 2. On Monday, Michael Klein at Viewer's Choice said that they hadn't made a decision about carrying the next show but that they have discussions with ECW scheduled for the future. Others in Viewer's Choice did confirm that they've agreed to carry the October 17th UFC show, which saves that product from the almost sure extinction that a decision by VC not to carry it would have resulted in. There were rumors that VC would put ECW on, but on its hot choice channel which is a secondary channel that would be in just over half the pay-per-view homes that the major VC channels are. While it wouldn't clear ECW universally besides the systems such as Time Warner and Cablevision that have decided system-wide not to carry the event, it would at least up the exposure by several million homes from what it was for this show. In response to all the protests to Cablevision from ECW fans, including Joey Styles, who resides in Stamford, Connecticut, the company issued a release defending its position. It claimed that by reviewing videotapes of the television show that the level of violence is incompatible with its own standards on violence on television. The strange double standard of that reasoning is those same television shows air on Cablevision on broadcast and cable channels that anyone has access to with no steps taken to avoid them airing, yet pay-per-view, where one has to go through specific steps to pay and see it, is being kept off the airwaves. It defended its broadcasting adult entertainment channels on pay-per-view because it has a standard of violence that those also have to adhere to. The angle where Sandman showed up and took Sabu out of the three-way title match appears to build up a singles match between the two at the next pay-per-view, which will likely be a ladder match. The usage of Sonny just before the finish in the Jerry Lawler vs. Tommy Dreamer match may result in a Chris Condito and Sonny vs. Dreamer and Beulah match either on that show or an arena show later this year to be marketed for videotape. Because of Sonny's name in the WWF, The novelty of her doing a wrestling match on pay-per-view would be a coup as far as getting some mainstream fans who don't know much about ECW curious about getting the show. Roberts may or may not return to ECW, but Heyman said that he wouldn't be putting Roberts in the ring as a wrestler and would likely never advertise him as appearing on a show ahead of time due to his track record, but may use him once every few months as a surprise in an angle since he'll get a big pop and he recognizes his major star power in small doses. Apparently Heyman was frantically calling WWF at the last minute trying to get the okay to use Sonny because his original plan was for Roberts to be the ultimate surprise, but then Roberts arrived so late that they were afraid he wasn't going to get there and they changed the plans and then he arrived. There was apparently some thought of using Roberts to go into Roberts vs. Dreamer, but that appears to be totally out the window. Although the crowd, which packed the 1,800-seat auditorium, came off as dead, except for a few big pops for carefully choreographed spots, The crowd at the end of the show did seem to be enjoying it at the end when the wrestlers were in the crowd as the show went off the air and the fans chanted ECW. A little less than half the crowd chanted for the encore curtain call, similar to what happened at the ECW arena for the first pay-per-view. It's not known exactly what was paid and papered in the crowd. ECW offered free tickets to anyone who flew down from Philadelphia as part of a travel package, which drew 101 people and there were also 40 people who flew in from Tokyo although they paid for their ringside tickets. The actual advance one week out was 800 tickets. We had reported 1,000 last week, and we were told the market was going to be heavily papered in the final days to fill the building. Before the show went on the air, they shot an angle in the building where two members of the rap band Insane Clown Posse were in the ring putting over their favorite wrestler, Rob Van Dam. Van Dam then turned on them, giving one a spin kick and another a tiger driver and put him in a camel clutch. Sabu came out in a suit, trying to look like the Sheik, and he is looking more and more like him by the day, and joined in until Sandman made the save. That didn't last long as Sabu threw a chair at Sandman and Van Dam kicked a chair into Sandman's head. Sabu came off the top rope with a chair and then put the chair on Sandman while he and Van Dam both came off the top rope at the same time onto him. Sandman did a stretcher job and was taken out in an ambulance. At the show went on they did a storyline where they had a helicopter which they called the Extreme Chopper follow the ambulance, which supposedly Sandman had commandeered and was driving, and he actually was driving it. The story was that since Sandman didn't know Florida, he was totally lost trying to find the building and supposedly we were told how he was stopping for directions at convenience stores to get directions, beer and cigarettes. Supposedly he mistakenly went to the night center, 
another building wrestling used to be held at a nearby Miami before the arena was built, before, just as the main event started. He showed back up at the right building. At this point he started caning supposed police officers. The lack of believability of these segments that played throughout the show made it again seem like an Abrams show in that they were copying bad ideas that WWF and WCW had done in the past in doing low rent, not that renting the chopper for the show was all that cheap, versions of them. To make matters worse, Lance Wright, who was doing the remote from the helicopter, froze, and never got across the points he was supposed to get across. There was the strong insinuation that Sandman was drinking while driving and even though this is all fantasy, although Sandman really was driving, it rubs me the wrong way really badly to glorify drinking while driving even if the gimmick of the performer is to be a drunk and the nature of the audience they play to. There was a lot of talk beforehand about doing that segment totally as a pre-tape, which is how WWF or WCW would have done it, in case of screw-ups, but it was done live. No doubt the posse angle was pre-taped in case using non-wrestlers in an angle looked bad. There were complaints from the fans live about the audience as a whole, and that they were said to have been really rude to the Japanese fan contingent with chance of USA at them and we won a war. Much of live the crowd also knew Jake Roberts was there because of the nature of how the wrestlers had to enter the arena. The show opened with Joey Styles in the ring. Rick Root came out and the fans chanted you sold out at him. Given ECW's working relationship with WWF, this makes as much sense as the day before on the WCW Saturday night show the fans chanting USA while Chris Jericho was wrestling Alex Wright. They tried to get the idea he turned his back on ECW by appearing on Raw last week with Shawn Michaels. Before the opener started, Todd Gordon came out and ordered Rude to the back so he didn't second any members of the triple threat on this card so that Angle may not be long for this world. 1. Taz, Peter Sinerka, beat Chris Condito, Chris Candito, in 1052. The two traded a lot of moves. The crowd really didn't get into it. The execution of the moves were good and Condito did a good job of selling, but the transitions were lacking and the match came off as flat like a well-worked mid-card All-Japan match. Actually the crowd response or lack thereof resembled one of the recent All-Japan TV tapings. Condito did a good job selling Taz Armbar Jujigatama, as it was called by Styles. Condito used a Frankensteiner off the top followed by a diving headbutt off the top before missing an Enzui Jiri. Taz put on a bow and arrow submission, but Condito escaped and came back with a power bomb. Taz used a belly-to-belly -belly superplex and did another suplex dropping Condito on his head. Condito came out later in the show wearing a neck brace. The finish was flat as Condito put Taz on the top rope and turned his back on him to posture to the crowd. From that position, Taz put on the choke and eventually Condito tapped out. Two and a half stars. Two. Bam Bam Bigelow, Scott Bigelow, pin Spike Dudley, Matt Heisen, in 505. Spike wasn't over in the least from the upset the previous week, unlike how the reaction would have been for a similar angle years ago. Since virtually all fans know that winners and losers are predetermined and thus not important, it's all-star power and the fans saw this as a squash match anyway even though Spike actually had beaten him clean the week before. From a standpoint of doing what should have been done, this match was the closest to 100% on the entire show. It was really good but it was short and a lot of fans dismissed the match from the start seeing it as a squash because one guy was 360 pounds and the other 150 pounds. Dudley took a beal early where he went high and far. He got near falls from a crucifix into a bulldog and another bulldog off the top rope. He went for a hurricane rana off the top but Bigelow caught him and gave him an incredible powerbomb. He pressed him and dropped him on the connective rod that holds the turnbuckle to the post, and Dudley took a bump to the floor. When he got back in the ring, Bigelow pressed him overhead and took a running start and threw him over the top rope over the guardrail into the front row which was the most memorable spot of the entire card. At this point Dudley was bleeding really bad, actually there were puddles in the ring, and the cameras pulled back. Bigelow got him in a shoulder breaker position but delivered a move more like a pile driver, and then used a moonsault headbutt to get the win. The EMTs frantically placed a pressure bandage on Dudley while others were mopping up the blood puddles in the ring to get ready for the next match. Dudley needed stitches for the cut, which we're told was a blade job and not hard way, but that most of his post-match selling was a work to sell the match and not a real injury. After receiving his stitches, he was in the cheering section of wrestlers as the main event came to a close. Two and one quarter stars. Three. Rob Van Dam, Rob Sotkowski, pinned Al Snow, Alan Sarvin, in 1343. Before the match they billed that it would be fought under Monday night rules, although that played no part into anything. Van Dam had WWF, WCW and ECW all tie-dyed on his ring outfit. 
this was similar to the first match, although better, in that there were a lot of good moves but the match lacked in both heat and transitions so it was more an exhibition of moves than a match. Snow used a pescado early. At another point, he used a wind sprint clothesline but the camera work totally blew the spot. Van Dam did a moonsault block off the guardrail and a great flip running dive over the top to the floor. Snow used a superplex off the top. Van Dam came back with a side kick off the top. He got a near fall with a splash off the top. Snow came back using some of Van Dam's spots on him. He used a northern lights bomb for a near fall. Snow drop kicked Van Dam off the top and Van Dam took a bump over the top rope onto a table. Snow hit a somersault plancha and used several chair shots. As he went for a second wind sprint clothesline, Van Dam hit him running with a chair. Van Dam crouched Snow on the top and kicked him come off the guard rail into a chair held by Bill Alfonso. After a totally blown spot, Van Dam using his Van Daminator, which is the move where he gives the guy the chair who holds it to his face and Van Dam kicks the chair into the face for the pin. Two and three quarter stars. Four. But Bob Ray and D. Von Dudley, Mark LaMonica and Devin Hughes, the PG-13, Kelly Wolf and James Crookshanks, in 1058 to retain the ECW tag titles that they were officially awarded when the gangsters couldn't show up and defend the titles. PG-13 were billed as USWA Tag Team Champions although they actually lost the title eight days earlier to Stephen Dunn and Flash Flanagan. JC Ice used Mike Work basically saying that Mama Dudley was a whore. The Dudleys came out with both Joel Gertner and Jenna Jameson, a porn movie star with Gertner calling himself Studley Dudley. Although Jameson proved to be very popular with everyone, she didn't have a screen presence as compared with the valets and other organizations which is surprising given her occupation. Ice kissed her early. PG worked face style and were on top until Wolfie missed a crossbody and was worked on. Finally with the ref distracted, Big Dick Choke slammed both PGs. They largely got heat on JC Devon is showing a lot of improvement as a worker. Jameson tripped up JC to get revenge. JC finally escaped with a low blow on Bubba and a DDT on Devon and made the hot tag out. Wolfie looked good with a power bomb on Devon and a face buster off the top rope on Bubba. JC did a dive out of the ring but was caught, and then Wolfie did another dive, and they did the domino effect with everyone splattering from that one. Finally in the ring they used the Dudley death drop on Wolfie for the pin. Two stars. 5. Tommy Dreamer, Tom Lachlan, pin Jerry Lawler in 1857. Lawler did an interview plugging the WWF Ground Zero pay-per-view, and although he did it in a heel-like fashion, some of the casual observers by this point had to take it almost as truth when he talked about seeing what a first-class pay-per-view is. And then, to make things look even worse for ECW, he did an interview which was almost word for word the same interview that he had done earlier in the show. This match in many ways epitomized the entire show. The guys worked really hard but did no wrestling, basing the match around low blows and turning the lights out, which by the fourth time the lights went out was more than a tad bit overdone. The match went too long and was totally over -gimmicked. Some people thought it was the best match and others thought it was the worst match. It was a simple story in that every time Dreamer was about to put Lawler away the lights would go out, a mystery person would arrive and finish off Dreamer, who would then miraculously still kick out of the pin. Lawler bladed in the first minute shortly after being hit in the head with a pan. Dreamer threw a beer and a burger in his face and gave him a crotch shot on the guard rail. They brawled into the crowd. Lawler whipped and choked Dreamer with a belt. Dreamer got to the top rope and took a bump off the top onto a chair. Outside the ring Lawler crotched Dreamer on the guard rail and punched him with the belt and then whipped him hard and choked him with the belt. Lawler used a pile driver for a near fall at which point the crowd began chanting that Lawler does something with 13-year-olds. Lawler ripped off Dreamer's ECW t-shirt and began wiping his armpits and his butt with it. Dreamer then did the Hogan Superman comeback. Lawler pulled down the strap for his own patented Superman comeback, but then collapsed on his face. Dreamer put the same shirt in Lawler's face. Lawler came back with five low blows in a row and then DDT'd ref Jim Molino. He went to crotch Dreamer on the post but Dreamer reversed it. Just as Dreamer was about to crotch Lawler on the post, the lights went out. When they come on, Rude was in the ring and he hit Dreamer twice in the head with a garbage can but Dreamer kicked out of the pin attempt. Lawler knocked out the ref again. Dreamer made another comeback and was about to pile driver Lawler when the lights went out again. This time it was Roberts. Lawler acted afraid of Roberts because of their old WWF feud that never went anywhere because Jake self-destructed. Roberts then DDT Dreamer and clotheslined Lawler. Lawler went to pin Dreamer but he kicked out again. Dreamer then went to DDT Lawler and the lights went out again. 
this time it was Sonny, who sprayed hairspray way over Dreamer's head but Dreamer had to sell it like it was in his eyes. Beulah went after Sonny. Lala then grabbed Beulah and picked her up for a pile driver. Dreamer grabbed a chair and was about to hit Lawler, who put Beulah in the way. Beulah then gave Lawler a low blow, and Dreamer then used the dreaded Gary Goodridge claw to the groin, hit a DDT and scored the pin. As mentioned earlier, this is one that is a matter of taste. To me it was a totally contrived over gimmick match with a work rate and even in many ways psychology the level of what you can see any night on an indie show and a storyline similar to every Hogan WWF match except with the lights going out to signal the run-ins rather than all the camera men running down the aisle to tip everyone off in the building ahead of time. For a promotion that wanted to protect low blows as a finisher but not overdoing them and have people selling them big every time they're used to get them over as a potential finish any time. This match contained dozens of them that were all sold momentarily and forgotten about. To make the psychology of building the match around a low blows even worse, they were used with far too much regularity early on in the show. While they did get the easy pops, by the time the low blows were supposed to mean something, they had been way past overdone. One half of one star. 5. Shane Douglas, Troy Martin, won the ECW title in a three-way dance over Sabu, Terry Brunk, and Terry Funk in 2637. Even though Funk did a heel interview regarding the state of Florida, when he came out, it was to polite applause with respect but no real enthusiasm. At the open of the show when Joey Styles announced the names of the three participants, all the names were booed. Crowd was dead early. Sabu did all kinds of daredevil spots and hit all of them but one. Funk used garbage can shots early. Douglas hit Sabu with a chair as he was covering Funk. Sabu jumped off a chair and springboarded off the ropes into a plancha into the first row on Douglas. He then did a springboard crossbody on Funk followed by an Asai moonsault on Funk. Funk set up two chairs in the ring. In tandem with Douglas, then lifted Sabu up and dropped him across the chairs for a near fall. Sabu came back with chair shots on both. Douglas brought a guard rail into the ring. Douglas ended up taking one regular bump into the rail, and a second bump when Sabu backdropped him into the rail. Sabu buried both Douglas and Funk under the rail and jumped off the top rope on both. Douglas used the belly to belly on both. They then did the spot where one would use the sleeper, the third guy would put the sleeper on the guy putting on the hold, causing him to release the hold, and then the guy released would put the sleeper on the guy now with the hold. Sabu did his triple jump moonsault in the ring on Douglas. He tried a second one and this was the one spot he missed as the chair slipped and he fell down. Sabu then did another triple jump moonsault on both. Bill Alfonso ran in and put Funk on a table. Todd Gordon ran in and attacked Alfonso and pulled Funk off the table. At this point Sabu put a chair on the top rope and was going to moonsault off the chair through the table, but it took him literally forever to get the balance of the chair right, not to mention the timing of it being the worst of Lucha Libre and how long it took to set up the spot but he did put Alfonso and Gordon through the table to the biggest pop of the match thus far. The three then started chopping each other with the fans treating it like Baba match comedy with their sarcastic hoos. Sabu then grabbed a ladder and hit both with really weak looking ladder shots and then punched the ref. Sandman then came out and put Sabu under the ladder and slingshotted himself in the ring and flipped with a senton onto him. Funk and Douglas both pinned Sabu at 1934. After the pin, Sabu got up and did a running leap off a chair and springboarded off the ropes way deep into the aisle onto Sandman and all the security guards who were dragging Sandman away. Douglas hit Funk with parts of the broken table and Funk came back with garbage can shots both to Douglas and to himself. Actually he was hitting himself much harder than Douglas with the garbage can. By this point many of the wrestlers had come from backstage in the aisle to watch to try and give importance to both the title and the eventual title change. Funk kicked out of a belly to belly, which style sold well but the crowd reaction to such an important spot in the match made it seem less important than it was supposed to be. Francine then did a run in and slapped Terry. Dory Funk did a run-in and threw the forearms at Douglas. Terry then schoolboy Douglas for a near fall that did get a really big pop but the crowd immediately died after the spot. Funk and Douglas then both went through a table off the apron. In the ring, Douglas used another belly to belly but Funk kicked out. He did it again, but Funk kicked out again, once again to no crowd response. Funk did an inside cradle for a near fall but then Douglas hit yet another belly to belly to score the clean pin. Overall a good main event great in some spots and weak in others. Three and one half stars. After the match, Douglas began whipping Funk with the title belt. Joel Gertner came out while the Dudleys stomped on Funk and asked Douglas to drop the triple threat and join the Dudleys so they'd have all the major belts. Condito, wearing a neck brace and Bigelow came out and they brawled with the Dudleys. 
at this point the ring filled with wrestlers. The triple threat kind of left since they had to get them out of there. The Dudleys played king of the ring in an absolutely pathetic brawl that went on way too long. Finally New Jack's music played for the climax where he and the Eliminators came out. The last two minutes of the show, with Saturn doing an elbow off the ropes, Cronus doing his hot moves including an incredible 450 splash on Gertner and a frog splash on Devon and New Jack using the weapons was a really hot finish. EMLL don't have much from here as the weekend shows were somewhat watered down because much of the crew was in Japan for a two-show tour. Like the tour earlier this year, this Japan tour had to be considered a disappointment. While they sold out Karakuen Hall to the tune of 1,850 on August 16th headlined by a battle royal won by Mr. Niebla, the other show on August 18th in Takaishi only drew 500 for a one-night tag team tournament which consisted of incredibly short matches with Ultraman Jr. and Shocker beating Black Warrior and Rei Bucanero in the finals. The tour was considered a disappointment because of the lack of major names, concentrating it around green undercard Japanese wrestlers Tsubasa and Shinobi who work in Mexico. Others on the tour were Mr. Aguila, Guerrero del Futuro, Violencia, Guerrero de la Muerte, Felino, Mano Negra Jr., and Super Astro. Even though Aguila and Warrior have both jumped to promo Azteca, they worked the show because they made the Japanese commitment before jumping. Promo Azteca Lots of rumors regarding wrestlers now jumping from this group back to EMLL. Nothing is official. Vampiro told friends this week that he would be leaving on August 20th to work a program in EMLL with Dr. Wagner Jr. and that most of the top names for this promotion that don't have WCW contracts would be leaving as well since EMLL hired Ricardo Reyes to work with Negro Casas in the booking. Reyes was the booker here when most of the non-WCW wrestlers joined the group, but lost out in a bitter power struggle over direction with Conan and the guys who aren't considered as Conan's guys may go to EMLL with Reyes in power. However, at a house show later in the week, Vampiro told Conan, who he has just started a program with that should draw very well, that he was staying. It is believed that Los Hermanos Dinamita are almost surely at the top of the list when it comes to those leaving, and that the original Mascara Sagrada, Super Electra Mariachi, uh, Batista and Angel Azteca are likely candidates and Vampiro is certainly a strong possibility. Of those names, the Dinamitas are a mixed blessing. They are the biggest name main event hill trio in the promotion, but they are all past their prime in a company building around young wrestlers. Sagrada has a name but he's also 38 years old. Vampiro has a name and is hot again and his potential feud with Conan should do business, while the other losses really have no business effect. Both Black Magic and Teen Yablas Jr., jumping from AAA, are expected to start before the end of the month. There is a meeting scheduled for the end of the month with Paco Alonso, Conan and Eric Bischoff where Bischoff is going to explain exactly what he wants and probably pressure both sides into a truce when it comes to not rating talent from each other. Anyone want to bet on the over and under when it comes to how long that one will last? The biggest show of the past week was August 15th in Xochimilco with Conan and Los Villanos vs. Vampiro and Dandy and Silver King and El Texano and La Parca and Lismark Jr. and Tarzan Boy and Zorro vs. Pieroth Jr. and Psicosis and Jerry Estrada and Purata Morgan as the headline matches. AAA. Pretty dead right now. There are still some cities where this group is drawing decently but most places aren't doing well. Pena will be introducing two new characters, a wrestler called Mambo to do a Latin dancer gimmick similar to Salsero in Azteca, and a masked wrestler called Torero to do a bullfighter gimmick similar to his creation of the original Torero, who is also now with Azteca. Biggest show of the week was August 15th in Carretaro with Pero Ogueo Jr. and Heavy Metal vs. Picudo and Sangre Chicana in a cage match, Connect defending the UA heavyweight title against Cybernetico and Team Yeblas Jr. and Super Muñeco and Blue Demon Jr. vs. Scarecrow and El Nene a newcomer who does a gimmick where he plays a fat baby with a diaper and a bottle, and Yeti. All Japan They opened the new tour on August 17th in Tota before 2,700 fans for the first meeting ever between Mitsuharu Misawa and Hiroshi Hase in a six-man. The results saw Misawa and Jun Akiyama and Satoru Asako beat Akira Tao and Hase and Yoshinari Ogawa in 23-33 when Akiyama pinned Ogawa with the Exploder Suplex. Misawa and Hase traded big moves while they were in with each other. New Japan After Yokohama Arena on August 31st, 
The next tour is the G1 Climax Special Tour which is traditionally one of the big tours of the year, from September 12th to September 23rd. No foreigners have been announced for the tour and this is usually, because they have major shows in Nagoya, Osaka and Tokyo in the final week, where they would load up on big names from WCW. The major focus appears to be a single elimination tag team tournament from September 12th and ending on September 20th in Nagoya with Satoshi Kojima and Manabu Nakanishi, Akitoshi Saito and Kengo Kimura, Shinya Hashimoto and Tadao Yasuda, Tatsutoshi Goto, and Mishiyoshi Ohara, Kazuo Yamazaki, and Kensuke Sasaki, Masahiro Chono and X, Osamu Kido and Junji Hirata, Takashi Izuka, and Kazuyuki Fujita, Tatsumi Fujinami and Akira Nagami and Great Muda and Hiroyoshi Tenzan. It's weird doing a tag tourney, particularly with virtually all Japanese members, Chono's partner could be a foreigner, when the October tour is the annual Super Grade Tag Team Tournament Tour. Don Fry and Naoya Ogawa will wrestle singles matches, but not against each other, on September 23rd at Budokan Hall which is the big show of the tour. In one of Ricky Choshu's final matches, he's working September 18th in Tokuyama, which is the city he grew up in, teaming with Sasaki against Goto at Ohara. Other Japan Notes Perfect TV which is a Japanese satellite company held a press conference this week to push the Nobuiko Takata vs. Hicks and Gracie Tokyo Dome match on October 11th. Ticket prices were announced as being 100,000 yen, about $850, for ringside down to 4,000 yen, $34, for the nosebleed seats. The match will also be the first ever pay-per-view show in Japan at a $17 price tag. There aren't enough homes that get perfect TV in Japan to where pay-per-view can do any kind of business like it does in the U.S., so this is more an experimental situation to try it out rather than a major money-making potential deal as the money is going to have to be made through the live gate and sponsorship. Because of the high ringside prices and promoters attempting such an undertaking that have never promoted a show before, there are people speculating that this is going to turn into a financial disaster if it even takes place. No other matches have been officially announced but they have announced Kimo, Tank Abbott and Koji Kiao as being on the show and are attempting to put Kimo vs Hugo Duarte, considered one of the top Brazilian heavyweights. FMW has announced for its September 28th show at Kawasaki Baseball Stadium two main events Atsushi Onita vs. Wing Kanemura in a no-rope barbed wire explosive electrified death match and Ken Shamrock vs. Vader. In addition, Kenna Kobashi of All Japan will have his first match ever against non-All Japan talent on the card which may be the biggest draw of all on the show, and also on the card will be Terry Funk, Asia Kong, and Great Pogo. Rings held a show on August 13th at the Kagoshima Arena before 3,380 fans with results that shook up the ratings before the start of the Battle Dimension Tournament in October. The top three rated fighters Folk Han, Kiyoshi Tamura and Tsuyoshi Kosaka all did jobs. Han lost via ref stop after a kick to the head from Yoshihisa Yamamoto in 11.30, Kosaka lost via submission in 9.14 to Akira Maeda, and Tamura lost via ref stop after a kick to Hansa Nyman in 9.03. One would suspect all three would have been works. Rings also crowned its first ever world champion as it ended a tournament that has gone on the past few cards to crown a champion in the 209 pound and underweight division, with Masayuki Naruse beating Christopher Hazeman in the finals. The tournament is weird in itself because both Tamura and Yamamoto are under 209 and neither was in the tournament, so why have a weight division and a supposed shoot? Since Rings is supposed to be a shoot, even though most of the time it isn't, when people under that weight compete as heavyweights. The winner of this year's Battle Dimension Tournament which ends in January will become Ring's first ever World Heavyweight Champion. With the shakeups, the new top six in order are Yamamoto, Han, Naiman, Tamura, Maeda, and Kosaka. Takashi Ishikawa's Ishikawa Ika promotion appears to be on the way to being dead and he's reopening the group in October as Tokyo Pro Wrestling, the name of the group he had run last year that went under. Shigeo Okamura, who is currently training in Calgary and working indie shows there, will be used as Ishikawa's top rival. Shudo will have a match on October 12 to crown its first heavyweight world champion. Shudo is the only 100% shooting group in Japan. K1 and Pancrase are predominantly but not exclusively shooting. The Nagoya Dome main event with Francisco Filio vs. Andy Hug looks suspicious as hell to me. Hug, who at times has been considered the top star in K1 despite losing numerous matches in the past including to some people like Patrick Smith, went down and out on the first punch that hit him against a guy who has never had a fight with gloves in his life, and rings usually hovers around half and half which is actually the weirdest of all. Rick the Jet Rufus, a big-name kickboxer in the US debuts with K1 on the September 7th Osaka Dome show against Jerome LeBanner. 
LLPW crowned its six women champions on August 15 at Karakuen Hall with the tourney final having Eagle Sawai and Shark Tsuchiya FMW, and Lioness Asuka, JD, beating Yasha Kurenai and Mikiko Futagami and Carol Midori. LLPW and JWP are going to have a working agreement. Modi Hornstein, 0-2 in UFC, 0-3 overall, debuts with Kingdom on the September 3rd show at Karakuen Hall against Kazushi Sakuraba. To make things worse for Michinoku Pro, Ren Hamada and Grand Naniwa are both out of action. Hamada suffered another knee injury while Naniwa broke his leg on July 26 and had an operation on August 5th. They are doing an angle in AJW regarding the All-Pacific title. Kaoru Ito vs Tomoko Watanabe for the vacant title is scheduled for August 22nd in Osaka, however the most recent champ, Inter Takako Inoue refuses to return the title belt. Takako says she's going to start training for her return by the end of the month and wants to lose the belt in the ring. The first ever singles match between Asia Kong vs Chigusa Nagio for the latter's AAW world title takes place on September 20th in Kawasaki. Dynamite Kansai of JWP returned to action on August 17th as part of an afternoon-evening doubleheader at Karakuen Hall. Kansai had been out of action a while due to liver problems which she's been suffering with for a long time. She only worked a prelim tag match which says something about her condition. That same evening show, which drew a sellout 2000, was Kandi Akutsu's final match losing to Ikari Fukuoka. Tomoko Miyaguchi captured the JWP Jr. title beating Tomoko Kuzumi on that show. The afternoon show drew a packed house of 1,900. The first singles match in more than a 15 years with Genichiro Tenryu vs Abdullah the Butcher is scheduled for September 9th in Kenazawa. The other big show of the next war tour is September 12th at Karakuen Hall with Tenryu and Yoshiaki Fujiwara vs Abdullah and Nobukazu Hirai in a six-man title match with champs Koki Kitahara and Lance Storm and Nobutaka Araya vs Koji Kiao and Masaaki Mochizuki and rookie Yoshikazu Taru. In the final card of the recent IWA tour on August 13th in Tokyo, King Kong Bundy did a job in a tag match for Daiko Kubo Benkei. This is to set Benkei up for a single match next month with Dan Severn. Luna Vachon brought her women's title belt from the defunct AWF to this group and dropped it on the same show to Emi Motokawa. USWA longtime announcer Lance Russell had quadruple bypass surgery on August 13. The surgery was successful and he was released from the hospital on August 17, although it will likely be some time before he returns to announcing or to hosting the Wrestling Observer Hotline. It was announced about Russell at the beginning of the television show over the weekend. Even though the next Memphis show is August 31st, which is a night where ECW doesn't have a card scheduled, at this point they don't have any plans of bringing anyone in from ECW. According to USWA officials, it's been hard to get a specific commitment from Paul Heyman. The August 8th show, without any ECW talent, actually drew 700 fans and $4,000 which they were thrilled with. Doomsday here is still Glenn Jacobs. WWF at first wanted him to come in immediately, where he couldn't even drop the strap to do the Kane gimmick. Kane is expected to debut at the Louisville pay-per-view show, but USWA has been told they can keep Jacobs for another six weeks. They still may put another wrestler under the gimmick after he leaves, and he's still got the title. Jerry Lawler hasn't been on TV in recent weeks. The belief is he'll continue to work here, but with far less frequency. Brian Christopher was married over the weekend. Buddy Wayne, who has worked behind the scenes for this promotion forever, was also taken severely ill this past week. Expect many changes when it comes to television in regard to look and production come September. WMC-TV has given a commitment that it will run a replay show on Sunday afternoons most, but not all weeks, during football season after the Saturday night midnight airing. They are talking about selling a t-shirt saying a coup if they get approval from Heyman. Expect ticket prices, which are still in the $4 to $7 range in most cities, to be raised and more of an emphasis put on t-shirts with catchy phrases due to the success of ECW. As it was put, if ECW draws 700 fans to a show, they can make a $15,000 house and $5,000 more in merchandise, while USWA with the same number of fans only takes in $4,000. Billy Travis has been rehired. He returned this week doing a gimmick based on the UPS strike, where he was picketing the television show claiming that the USWA was unfair to him. Booker Dutch Mantle is doing the loser gimmick with Bulldog Reigns, where every week on television he loses matches that you'd think he'd win. Mr. Wrestling Carl Fergie is back, this time as a heel. Former longtime tag partners Rex King and Steve Dunn are feuding. There's some talk of bringing back Brandon Baxter as a manager.
the minimum is still $40 for the undercard guys, but after wrestlers are there for a while and established they are moved up to a $100 per night minimum which is why wrestlers like Doug Gilbert and PG-13 returned. Here and there. USWF drew a near sellout 4,200 fans, both the promoter and the local newspaper reported that figure although our live reports said it looked to be 3,500 on August 16th in Amarillo, Texas with two major upsets. In the women's light heavyweight title match which was pushed as the main event because on the previous two shows it was the women's match that drew the most crowd heat, local wrestler Lisa Hunt upset 1996 US Olympic judo team member Donya Biera in just 43 seconds with a front choke. Vieira, who is scheduled to compete in the Pan American Games in Judo on August 26 and the World Championships in October, had never been choked out in her entire Judo career. The other major upset was Sean Sheldon, a 1988 and 1992 Greco-Roman Olympian losing to 20-year-old local wrestler Brent Medley in the first round of the under 145-pound weight class. Sheldon dominated the match with his wrestling, but had no striking or submission skill and could never put Medley away in a match that went 20 minutes regulation and a 5 minutes overtime. Medley got the decision because Sheldon got called for one rope break which is the criterion used if it goes the distance. Dan Severn, who was said to have looked in tremendous shape, physically dominated local martial artist Paul Buntello in beating him with a headlock choke in 255. Michael Buell of Phoenix ended up winning the under-145 tournament beating Bobo Navarrete in 649 with a triangle choke. Buell was said to have looked the most impressive of anyone on the show, in another surprise, Paul Jones survived a more competitive bout than expected in beating Tony Castillo in 7-12 with a choke. Becky Levy, 6 foot 2 and 210 pounds who trains with Don Fry was introduced to the crowd and challenged any women in the crowd to a match. To everyone's shock, and this wasn't an angle but reports we got were that if it had been it couldn't have come off better, a 225-pound woman came out of the crowd to challenge her. They had to hem and haw because nobody expected this to happen and they wound up agreeing to do the match on the next show on October 18th, which will be billed as Battle of the Belts. Buell faces Diego Acosta to crown the first USWF lightweight champion, Evan Tanner faces Heath Herring to crown the first USWF heavyweight champion, and Paul Jones faces someone yet to be determined to create the first USWF light heavyweight champion. The show was said to have been from a technical fighting standpoint the best in the history of the promotion. As the fighters get better and more experienced, the matches become longer and less explosive as they learn defensive fighting so from a spectator standpoint the matches were longer and were not as exciting as the previous two major shows because the skill level across the board was higher. Severn will be featured on the show 48 hours on August 25th. IWF has released what it calls a tentative lineup for its first pay-per-view show on October 11th from Sioux City, Iowa as Dennis Hall, 1996 Olympic Greco-Roman silver medalist, versus Hoa Roque, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Townsend Saunders, 1996 Olympic Greco-Roman silver medalist, versus TBA Kenny Monday, 1988 Olympic wrestling gold medalist and EFC welterweight champ, versus TBA Carlos Newton, Canadian Jiu-Jitsu champ, versus Chris Barnes, two-time NCAA wrestling champion at Oklahoma State, Igor Zinoviev, EFC middleweight champion, or 0-1 NHB record, versus Mike Van Arsdale, 1997 World Cup wrestling champion, Frank Shamrock vs. Leigh Gutches, 1996 Olympian who holds several wins in amateur wrestling over Kevin Jackson, and Tom Erickson, 1997 U.S. Super Heavyweight Freestyle Champion and 5-0-1 in NHB, vs. TBA. If they can actually put that caliber of matches together, and the quality of athletes in it is as strong as on any pay-per-view show to date it should be at least an intriguing show, although getting the public to buy a new sport without striking is going to be hard. The WWO shows tentative for August 23rd and August 24th in San Diego and San Jose have been postponed. They are talking about running dates for both cities in late September but that's based on availability of the top talent from Mexico necessary to run markets of that size and arena availability. There is also talk of running a show on August 31st back in Watsonville, California with a main event of Psicosis vs. El Ejo del Santo but that also has not been locked in. The biggest indie show in a long time in the Carolinas took place on August 15th in Kannapolis, North Carolina before 600 fans. The return of Johnny Valentine to work Greg's Corner ended up not happening as neither were there with reports saying Johnny wouldn't come without a plane ticket for his wife. Many credit Johnny with turning the Jim Crockett Sr. steady mid-Atlantic territory in a national power promotion in the mid-70s before being forced to retire from wrestling after a 1975 airplane crash that also broke the back of Ric Flair. Among those working the show were Ricky Steamboat, as a referee for the Masked Superstar vs. Jimmy Snuka main event, 
Stan Lane as a ring announcer, Uffa and Sika, the Road Warriors, who beat Vladimir Koloff and Nikolai Volkov, and Manny Fernandez. In the crowd and introduced were Nelson Royal, Swede Hansen, and Jackie Fargo. Ian Rotten will be working the next NWA show in Yardville, New Jersey as they are doing the opposite end of the NWA vs. IWA feud. What was a scheduled reuniting of the Dream Team? Greg Valentine and Brutus Beefcake, who held the WWF Tag Team titles in 1985-86 on August 16th in Lake Elsinore, California for Mid-American Wrestling before 1,000 fans didn't take place since Beefcake no-showed. Valentine instead teamed with woman wrestler Reggie Bennett to beat the Power Twins, and Bennett and Tito Santana were the final two survivors in a battle royal on the same show. On both that show and Roland Alexander's All-Pro Wrestling show on August 15th, in Hayward, Mexican minis Ultimo Dragon Cheeto and Pierre Oftito were scheduled. However, Pierre Oftito was stopped at the border so a green wrestler who looked to be about 5 foot 6 billed as Ultra Taro wrestled Dragon Cheeto. The All-Pro show did an angle involving Robert Thompson, who got an offer for a job from ECW stemming from our recommendation, but turned it down because he's got a one-year-old daughter. In the angle, Thompson acted as if it would be his final match in APW, gave the speech putting over ECW in the pay-per-view show, but then said he was staying. Also on that show there was a match with Michael Modest vs. Aaron O'Grady, which was a better match than anything on the last three pay-per-view shows. At least it looked that way that night. I've been to enough shows to know that reactions are based on surroundings and what looks to be a great match on an indie show often could be transported to a major promotion and look like crap because on a major show you see the overall quality flaws when it comes to experience in selling and transitions although the work was so solid in this match I think it would have been good anywhere. The August 10th St. Petersburg Times had a story on the Mad Dog Palace of Pro Wrestling, a wrestling school run by Brett Sawyer in Largo, Florida. The story claimed, among other things, that Hulk Hogan has trained at the gym, that the Giant learned his choke slam there, and that 123 Kid and Magnum TA had trained there, actually Magnum TA trained with older brother Buzz Sawyer. Major Advance Warning Department Dean Silverstone's annual Northwest Pro Wrestling reunion will be July 17th and July 18th next year. This is for wrestlers only. For more info write to 201 Knee 45th Street, Seattle, Washington 98105. Dan Cook of the San Antonio Express wrote a column on August 10th about a famous experience he had several decades ago with Fritz von Erich. When I was a kid, this was actually a very famous wrestling story. In 1968, Cook, then a TV sportscaster in San Antonio, interviewed von Erich, who at the time was a super draw as a Nazi heel in the city drawing sellout crowds at the local auditorium every week. Cook told Von Erich that he wanted to do an intelligent interview with none of the wrestling BS. Von Erich said okay, but was evidently pissed off as in those days you didn't say things like that. Anyway, as the interview started, Von Erich put Cook in the claw. In the column, Cook acted as if it happened with no warning out of nowhere which it may have done since his memory should be good on that although the story we'd heard nearly 30 years ago was that Cook asked him to put the claw on because he wanted to show how fake it was. Anyway, Cook couldn't get loose and used the same claw that Goodridge, Dreamer, and Lawler have been using onto Fritz. He screamed, got up from the chair and limped out of the studio. Northern States Wrestling on September 26th in Westland, Michigan has Tito Santana on the show. NHB. Virtually nothing new on the next UFC show. Maurice Smith was the guest on the NBC show later, which airs after Conan O'Brien for 30 minutes on August 13th with host Joe Rogan. Since Rogan has done backstage interviews at the past two UFCs, he was very knowledgeable about the subject. Smith came off as good, but not great, but being a cool likable guy with a good sense of humor. Really I couldn't think of a top pro wrestler today who if put in the same position for 30 minutes would have come off so well as a person rather than just a weirdo doing a gimmick. It was very positive in that sense and all of the talk about UFC was positive including Rogan saying that the people who want it banned are commissions controlled by boxing and wrestling officials who are afraid of the general public realizing there is more to a fight than guys standing up and punching each other and that in a real fight Mike Tyson wouldn't be nearly what the public thinks him to be. The clips they showed were very tame, including not airing any clips of Smith's knockouts in EFC or kickboxing. They talked about the Mark Coleman match and Smith said that after being hit with him, he really doesn't punch like a girl but that he said that to get the guy to come out fast and get tired fast, as part of his strategy. Rogan said that Coleman is this huge pumped up guy and Smith started laughing at the term pumped up almost as if he was thinking steroids, but knew not to say it. Vitor Belfort nor the date of the next UFC was brought up during the show. One of the reasons Smith will be on the next UFC is that now that he's UFC champion, 
Semaphore Entertainment Group didn't want him going to Japan and losing work matches with rings and Smith agreed to not do that provided Semaphore Entertainment Group paid him what he would have made in Japan. WCW It seems the title situation is back where it was after all. After Scott Hall and Kevin Nash didn't have to drop their tag belts to the Steiners as planned, and it is true that serious consideration was given to an angle where High Voltage would beat Steiners for the belts as a fluke, because they complained the company was doing too many title changes and hurting the credibility of the belts. And thus the Cruiser title switch scheduled also didn't happen. Everything has again been reversed. I can only speculate about what went down after Road Wild, but the undercard programs look to be back as planned. Chris Jericho won the Cruiserweight title from Alex Wright at the August 12 television tapings in Colorado Springs, Colorado. This looks to free right up for winning the TV title from Ultimo Dragon at a clash on August 21. This is after our press time. In addition, it appears Jericho's title reign isn't going to last long and that Eddie Guerrero will wind up with the belt, although maybe at the pay-per-view if not at the clash, to give Deborah McMichael a stable of champions with Jeff Jarrett, Guerrero, and Wright. So when the dust cleared, we have almost weekly title switches again, but Hall and Nash didn't have to lose their match. Several people were joking during the week that when Disco Inferno wouldn't do a job, he wound up fired. Luckily wrestling companies don't have double standards, do they? The clash card had to be redone since the Steiners didn't get the tag belts and Dean Malenko and Chris Benoit haven't been put together yet. Fall Brawl on September 14th in Winston-Salem, North Carolina is scheduled as war games with Steiners and Lex Luger and Giant vs. Hall and Nash and Savage and Six, Flair vs. Page, Jarrett vs. Malenko for the US title, Guerrero vs. Jericho for the Cruiserweight title, Wright vs. Dragon for the TV title and Wrath and Mortis vs. Barbarian and Meng. Hopefully they'll throw in another match or two with good workers although the show does look to be better than average in its current form on paper. They sold 4,000 tickets for $100,000 the first day tickets went on sale. Nitro on August 18th from Birmingham, Alabama drew a sellout and possibly the largest crowd and definitely the largest house in the history of that city with 10699 paying $175,969. The crowd was super hot almost throughout. The show came off surprisingly well considering all the turmoil backstage. All of the Mexicans with the exception of La Parca no showed. Not sure what is going to transpire out of this because there had been problems with guys making several house shows or arriving late and not being able to be put on due to problems flying out of Mexico, Juventud Guerrera in particular has missed numerous house shows due to trans problems, WCW has asked the wrestlers to fly out one day early to avoid the problems. Most of the Mexican wrestlers were given raises, they still earn on the whole far less than their non-Mexican counterparts, partially because they'd have to give updates in Mexico to come in one day early. Anyway the whole crew was supposed to get in Sunday night, and Parker was the only one who came in the rest switched their tickets to Monday, and then due to screw-ups, arrived late and never made the show. That's why during the interview they talked about a Ric Flair vs. Conan match and instead six wrestled Flair. They also had scheduled Jericho defending against Guerrera, entire match cancelled, and Dragon defending against Silver King which would have been a classic, switched to Parker which was still a good match. Impromptu show saw Harlem Heat beat Bagwell and Norton via DQ in 4.34 when Vincent interfered but Heat cleaned house after. Really good Heat, but not a good match, particularly Norton and Stevie Ray. Barbarian pin Mortis with a high kick in 2.21 of a bad match, with the predictable Wrath and Meng run-ins after. Okerlund interviewed Flair and Hennig. Fans cheered Flair and booed Hennig. Unless things change, Hennig was rescheduled to turn on Flair at the Clash. Stevie Richards pinned Scotty Riggs in 5-13 with a Stevie kick. Raven, who got a big reaction, DDT'd Richards after the match. Richards looked slightly below average. Benoit and McMichael beat Jarrett and Eddie Guerrero in 5-12 when McMichael scared Deborah into dropping the US belt, and he clocked Jarrett with it for the pin. An excellent TV match, particularly Benoit looked like the best wrestler in the country during the match and Guerrero isn't too far behind. Flair beat 6 via DQ in 5-47 when Vincent, Bagwell and Norton interfered and Hennig made the save. Better than their pay-per-view match but still only average although Six looked good and Flair was just there but he did get heat just for being who he is. JJ Dillon did an interview with Nick Patrick saying WCW investigated the tag title match at Road Wild and that Patrick made the right move in the DQ. Patrick then said Randy Anderson blew the call in the title match. Anderson came out and argued with Patrick. Dragon beat Parka in 4.08 with the Dragon Sleeper in the TV title match. Very good short match including Dragon doing a tremendous plancha. 
Giant no contest Hennig in 405. Giant was about to beat Hennig when Bischoff ran to the ring and won a Giant arrested because Bischoff had come closer than 50 feet to Giant. It wound up with Larry Zabishko out there and Giant out and Bischoff tried to escape in the crowd but Giant snatched him before being pulled off him. Okerlund interviewed Dylan and eventually Sting came out and grabbed a sign from the crowd indicating he wanted a match with Hogan. He still didn't speak. Dylan acted like Sting needed to talk with him. The heat for that match was incredible. Right now it's planned for December at a new 22,000-seat arena in Washington, D.C. where they are going to scale prices for a $600,000 house, but it's so hot they should probably move it to the Hoosier Dome. Finally Luger and Page beat Hall and Nash via DQ in 1340 when Norton 6. Bagwell and Savage all interfered just as Luger got the hot tag. Flair and Giant made the save as the show went off the air about 15 minutes longer than scheduled. Bout was about what you'd expect as far as moves, but the psychology and timing was excellent, as was the heat. But it was the same weekly main event run in DQ finish that they had already done twice before on the same TV show. We don't have complete details on the ratings, although from a pattern standpoint it looks to be identical, but with more viewers than last week. WCW drew a 4.0 rating, 3.7 first hour, 4.3 seconds hour, and 6.8 share. WWF drew a 3.1 rating, 2.9 rating first hour, 3.4 seconds hour, and 5.0 share which is its best showing in a head-to-head, -head, or semi-head-to-head -head would be more accurate, in a long time. Nitro Replay did a 2.0 rating, 1.9 first hour, 2.1 seconds hour, and 3.9 share. The total audience watching was huge, as the combined rating of the head-to-head -head hour was 7.2 which would be the all-time record for head-to-head -head segment although that also is misleading because on August 4th when they did a combined 7.11 it was over a two-hour period which is more impressive than a 7.2 over one hour. But by any evaluation, it was again very impressive just how many people were watching wrestling. Other weekend shows saw Saturday night at 2.3 and Pro at 1.6 with main event preempted. House shows for the week saw August 12th in Colorado Springs, Colorado for the TV taping drew a packed house of 1,500 paying $17,000. Nothing really eventful on the show that aired over the weekend besides the cruiser title change and that Yuji Nagata won a squash. Flair and Hennig beat Wrath and Mortis in the TV main. August 16th in Huntsville, Alabama drew 4,304 paying $75,550 and August 17th in Tupelo, Mississippi drew 2,964 paying $52,009. Giant vs. Nash, outside interference DQ of course, headlined both nights. The Nitro on October 6th in Minneapolis which went on sale on August 15th has already sold 6,364 tickets for $125,933. San Francisco, Salt Lake City and Seattle all did about 3,000 tickets for $70,000 for first day sales. Strange but true wrestling stories. On one of the shows this past week they had a match with Lismark Jr. vs. Roadblock, where Lismark Jr. not only did the job but didn't even get one offensive flurry in during the match. The August 13th Chicago Tribune in the Tempo section had a story on Hulk Hogan, which would have had to have improved tremendously to qualify even as a puff piece. It read more like a personal publicity release than a newspaper story, with ridiculous quotes like Dennis Rodman would earn 10 times as much money if he wrestled full-time than he would playing basketball. The story said that Hogan has shot a pilot for TNT called Shadow Warriors in which he is the John Wayne of the 90s. His other most believable quote regarding Vince McMahon was, there was a wrestling promoter during the late 1980s, who he doesn't mention by name, who was on a negative vibe most of the time. He would say, Terry, wrestling will never be as big as it once was. There will never be that media awareness. Your career will never be as great as it was during the 1980s. I responded short-sighted, no vision, loser, see you later. I'm proving now that wrestling is bigger and hotter than it's ever been. Boy I believe things went down in that situation exactly as Hogan described them almost as much as I believed everything I read in that icon piece on Vince. WWF. The latest on Steve Austin is that, as said on television, he had an appointment with one of the leading neck specialists in the country on August 19th in Philadelphia. At press time we don't have any details on what the doctor recommended. Everything regarding Austin is up in the air right now so this is all what would be tabbed, semi-educated speculation. He won't be wrestling for sure until September 7th. He may work that pay-per-view show but the odds may also be against that happening. At that point the tag titles will go to the winner of the four-way match. 
he probably will return to the ring but have to modify his style to where he doesn't take any moves that would be dangerous to his neck such as high angle suplexes on the back, DDTs, pile drivers or power bombs. The neck injury is expected to completely heal, although it was clear from the television interview it was far from healed at this point, but he'll always be susceptible to re-injury which is why he'll likely have to modify his style. The one-night-only pay-per-view from Birmingham, England was officially announced by Sky as a two-hour show starting at 8pm on September 20th. No price has been officially announced for the show. As of August 18th, there were only about 200 tickets remaining in the 12,000-seat NEC arena. The current plan for the pay-per-view show is Bret Hart vs. Austin for the WWF title, Bulldog vs. Michaels for the European title, Undertaker vs. Ahmed Johnson, which will likely be changed since Johnson likely won't be ready by then, Owen Hart vs. Helmsley, and LOD vs. Godwins. Vader vs. Tiger Ali Singh, Rockabilly vs. Flash Funk and Headbangers vs. Savio Vega and Miguel Perez will likely be dark matches. Raw on August 18th drew a sellout 8,672 paying $155,261 in Atlantic City, New Jersey. The show opened with a Rick Rude interview. Rude's gimmick is that he's doing a protection racket gimmick. Apparently last week when Michaels found out about Rude doing the bodyguard gimmick, he cried and complained because he didn't want Rude and if he wanted a bodyguard he wanted Helmsley, so Rude will be with him a little longer but then move on to other things, if everything works out. Rude has yet to sign a WWF contract so in this climate, putting him on television carried some kind of a risk. The plan is for him at this point to only work television. Owen Hart and Bulldog beat LOD in 457 when Godwins came out and Henry hit Animal with a bucket and Owen pinned him. Godwins beat on LOD after the match until for some reason, well, obviously since they are building up a four-way, Owen and Bulldog made the save, but then LOD attacked both teams. Flash Funk pinned Brian Christopher in 342 with a 450 splash. Christopher had the match won and was on the top when Lawler told him to use a pile driver, and in the stalling he wound up getting crotched on the top rope. It was hilarious because Jim Ross said that it was Ward giving advice to the Beaver, and then asked where June was and then he said, oh yeah, she's the one getting the alimony check. Good TV bout. Ken Shamrock beat Sultan with an ankle lock after using the belly-to-belly -belly on both Sultan and Iron Sheik in 316. Shamrock looked very good here. Nation of Domination came out and Farouk did a strong interview. Rocky Maivia blamed the fans for saying Rocky sucks and die Rocky die when he was a babyface for his choice. He pushed hard that it wasn't a racial deal. DOA then were on the video wall and challenged them to come into the parking lot for a fight. They had the fight which certainly paled by comparison to Steve Regal vs. David Finley then again. Every parking lot brawl in history pales by comparison to that which ended with Los Bariquas stealing the bikes and driving off, and DOA chasing after them. During the melee, Kama's head accidentally went through the windshield of a car which happened to be Jim Cornette's in real life. Jesse Jean beat Pillman by a DQ in 147 when Goldust ran in and dropped an elbow on Jean causing Pillman to lose, and have to wear the dress one more week. After the match Pillman challenged Goldust to a match on the pay-per-view where if he loses, he leaves the WWF forever, but if he wins, he gets Marlena for 30 days. Goldust refused. Pillen then said that their daughter Dakota was really his daughter. Goldust freaked out and then Marlena out of nowhere accepted, and Goldust acted like he couldn't understand where Marlena was coming from. Good angle. Kind of funny as well. Patriot pinned Vader clean with the full Nelson drop which they are calling Uncle Slam in 455. Vader didn't look as good as you'd think, but the storyline got over well as after the match, Vader jumped Patriot and was about to squash him, when Brett ran in and buried Patriot under the Canadian flag. Vader was mad about Brett doing it and broke the flagpole, and it wound up with Vader and Brett going at it to set up their main event title match on the Raw special that is taped on August 23rd in Chicago and airs August 29th. Owen and Bulldog then attacked Vader until Patriot made the save for Vader. They showed a taped Austin interview from a hotel room talking about his injury. TV main was Undertaker and Mankind over Michaels and Helmsley via DQ in 1218. Rude came out and was about to hit Undertaker with a chair but Undertaker turned around and Rude dropped the chair. Michaels wound up hitting Taker with the chair for the DQ and Taker did a major blade job on himself. I was surprised about not only emphasis of the blood as the closing scene, but showing two different replays where it was clear he was blading himself, particularly after all the talk for so many years how they'd never allow their wrestlers to do such a barbaric practice. At the shotgun taping, Owen and Bulldog beat Dude Love and Goldust, Maivia beat Funk, Bangers and Sing won a squash and Recon and Sniper beat Blackjacks. 
Interrogator also won a battle royal while the dark main event saw Brett over Vader and Taker in a triangle match that went only 237. Besides Raw, the other weekend numbers saw Livewire at 1.3 and Superstars at 2.0. Jim Cornette almost surely won't be going back to ECW. The September 7th Louisville show sold out over the weekend. August 23rd in Chicago is going to be a long night as not only are they taping two different Raw episodes, but also two different shotgun episodes or six hours of television. They are hopeful they can get it all done in around four hours. Weekend house shows saw August 15th in Springfield, Massachusetts draw $4,294 and $69,291, August 16th in Boston at the Fleet Center for the first WWF show in that building drew $8,698 and $157,869, and August 17th in New Haven drew $4,289 and $76,810. For the weekend they did $186,000 in merchandise or $7.17 per head. Unlike the usual, all the house shows were different this week. In Springfield and Boston they ran the same angle where Brett said his match with Undertaker would be non-title. Pat Patterson then comes out and says it'll be a title match. The two argue ending with Brett attacking Patterson. In both cities, Mankind beat Helmsley and Falls Count Anywhere matches. Boston match was said to have been great. Undertaker beat Brett via DQ in both cities due to outside interference. In Springfield they put tickets on sale for the December 7th pay-per-view and there were huge lines. That show was said to have been bad to mediocre. Boston was said to have been really good with strong Mankind vs. Helmsley and Undertaker vs. Brett matches. They also had a battle royal with the winner to get a title shot on November 29th, won by Shamrock throwing out Helmsley and Maivia. Shamrock also beat Vader via tap-out, No doubt Shamrock with the Irish last name is going to get the major push in the Boston market. New Haven had a really bad undercard in an average main event, with Undertaker and Goldust and Dude Love over Brett and Pillman and Bulldog. WWF is bringing back drug testing for a combination of reasons, largely to nip problems in the bud, a poor choice of phrases, before they become real problems. There was a scare on an airplane with a wrestler passing out coming at about the same time as the warning article in The Observer, and the drug references in Phil Mushnick's column and after past history. They made what is the best choice for long term. Bulldog was wearing a heavy knee brace on Raw from cumulative knee problems which is another reason why he's dropped weight to take pressure off his knees. Takamichi Noku was offered a contract but hasn't signed. He's told people he won't sign until he gets the okay from Great Sasuke to do so, although he is expected to work the Chicago taping. Current plans look to be for Doug Furness and Phil Lafon to be back in October. Brackus may work a few house shows here and there underneath but don't expect him to get a television role for a few months. Mark Henry is being brought back to training after recovering from his broken leg. At one point it was thought he'd never be back, but now they are bringing him back to training but somewhat skeptical of whether or not he'll make it because he got the rep the last time of thinking he was a star and not wanting to learn anything. Yokozuna is still under contract but they want him to get down to 400 pounds and it just isn't happening. He had a recent heart scare but his heart recovered after changing his medication. Of the six minis that were signed, five of them are Mascara de Sagrada, Mascara de Sagrada Jr., Octagon Cheeto and Espectritos 1 and 2, aka Mini Vader and Mini Mankind. They may be repackaged and given new names. Mascara de Jr. will probably get the biggest push out of the group and they'll try to heavily market him with the novelty of being the world's smallest professional athlete. For the month of July in England, the four episodes of Raw averaged 227,000 viewers per week while Nitro averaged 120,000 viewers. Summer Slam, which airs on television as opposed to pay-per-view, drew 266,000 viewers live, which is in the middle of the night, and 251,000 viewers on the replay. The Reader's Pages WCW At first glance, Eric Bischoff looks to be nothing short of a miracle worker. However, Nitro and WCW are based almost entirely on hotshot angles and screw job finishes. We all know what happens long-term to promotions and bookers that rely on those tactics. Dan Weisberg. New York, New York. I think Eric Bischoff has been to one too many Vegas review shows. Does he really think the Nitro girls doing a bump and grind for 5 to 10 minutes of airtime every week is going to help Monday night ratings? Sure, he may argue that Kimberly Falkenberg and her little dancing troupe are akin to cheerleaders at a sporting event, but these telecasts don't waste valuable air time on them. That's what intermissions are for. If Bischoff has all that much air time to waste, he should use it for wrestlers to do longer and better matches. The product on Nitro has been suffering from too much NWO, 
Too many names the masses don't and never will care about, too much lame hype for has-beens like Kurt Hennig and non-wrestlers like Dennis Rodman, too many confusing or contrived angles that Glacier Rath Mortis or Jarrett M.C. Michael. Glorified dancing girls aren't the answer. As cute as they are, they won't help the ratings, plus they expose Bischoff as the self-serving hypocrite he is considering the comments he made on Prodigy taking Vince McMahon to ask for his exploitation of women. When does Bischoff decide to accept victory and move on? He's beating WWF in the ratings. Big deal. WCW did that for years before Nitro was ever around. What good can come from a third hour of Nitro? The only thing that can happen is overexposure and declining buy rates. It's too bad that WWF can't win even one week since Raw has been the consistently better show over the past several weeks. For those who criticize the Hart Foundation for starting a US versus Canada war, I'd liken the scenario more as a friendly rivalry of nationalistic pride along with lines of Michael Johnson versus Donovan Bailey or World Cup hockey than a bitter cold war. The WWF should book more shows in Canada since the heat they get there is incredible. Do love is a good idea in small doses. Ken Shamrock has shown he can make a smooth transition to pro wrestling without losing too much credibility. Now I hope Patriot can program WWF audiences to all Japan psychology and spots. The WWF should go after as many Michinoku pro wrestlers as they can since that promotion is in a precarious position. Great Sasuke, Taka Michinoku, Shiryu and company would be an excellent counter to WCW's luchadores, since their Jap lucha style is superior in terms of both work and psychology to WCW's lucha spotfests. Michinoku is in my opinion one of the top five workers in the world right now and he'd be a great asset to the WWF. On the flip side, I wish McMahon would phase out the gang mentality that's taken over his promotion. He seems so worried about the success of the NWO that he's taken the idea and run it into the ground with the Canadian gang, the American gang, South African gang, Black gang, Biker gang and Puerto Rican gang. It's rather disheartening for me to see a great indie group like Michinoku Pro that has survived in an industry of corporate giants to go into a rapid decline, not to mention seeing what a bad businessman Sasuke has turned out to be. Even more disheartening to me is seeing the slow death of women's pro wrestling, particularly all Japan women. Their stubborn old school management is mainly at fault for this. Their refusal to cut down on their insane 250 plus show schedule has resulted in their veterans suffering consistent serious and even career ending injuries or jumping to rival groups who have a less taxing schedule. Their amazingly unimaginative booking ideas have resulted in a lack of new stars getting over who can take over for the broken down or washed up veterans. There may be light at the end of the tunnel with the emergence of a young, fresh promotion full of promising new talent in Gia, and the presence of the most underrated hill group in wrestling today in the Oz Academy. Ramon Lors. Flushing, New York. On August 1st on WAF Radio out of Worcester, Massachusetts, Six and Scott Hall were on the morning show. It was pretty entertaining. Hall was funny and Waltman was more serious. Both violated WCW policy by referring to both Ric Flair and Roddy Piper as old has-beens. All said it was time for the dinosaurs to be put out to pasture and that they've made their money and they should step aside and let the current stars shine. The host brought up Dennis Rodman and Hall said that he thought Rodman and Hulk Hogan were lovers. At one point the host and his sidekick started a mock in-studio challenge to them and referred to them as pussies. Hall returned the insult but Six said he wasn't allowed to use words like pussy because he'd get into trouble. Both acknowledged that they were married and had kids. Both said nothing negative about the WWF. They both said they enjoyed their time there and that the less frantic travel schedule was the biggest plus in leaving the WWF. Someone faxed in a question if we'd ever see Razor Ramon or 123 Kid again, and Hall said only on old videos. Another person faxed asking if Hall had Michael Hickenbottom's phone number. Hall said he did but wasn't going to give it out. Before they left Hall let it slip that he expects to turn on Hogan. After that crummy nitro from the Fleet Center, there's no way I'm going to see WCW in Worcester. You know WCW very badly wants to outdraw the WWF at the Centrum. They are spending a ton of money advertising on WAF. Commercials were constant for a week plus they advertised in the Globe, Herald and on other radio stations. The WWF also advertises on WAF when they come to Worcester but never to the extent WCW has. WCW can hire all the models they want to be Nitro Girls but they'll never be able to touch WWF or ECW when it comes to beautiful women. The women in ECW and WWF can actually work spots. Can Kimberly or Deborah McMichael? I hope this means WCW got rid of that lame guy in the cat suit. I wanted Nash to power bomb him bad. ECW is looking more and more desperate these days.
The Rick Rude Hill turn was great and the attack on Sandman and Dreamer was great. But Taz sucks. There's no way around it. He's 5 foot 5 and while he's built like a fire plug and can wrestle decent enough, his lack of charisma is a death knell in every angle he's involved in. He also hates to sell. You know he's going over Chris Condito even though Condito is everything Taz isn't. Sandman is a joke as well. I can't believe WCW had any interest in him. Besides drinking beer, smoking cigs and hitting people with a cane, what can he do? Shane Douglas as champion again? Mike Work doesn't make someone a great wrestler except in rare cases like Lawler and Piper. Terry Funk is what Hall and Six were talking about. Andy Thurston. Waltham, Massachusetts. Gonzalez. Your reporter wrestler was stabbed in the eye in Bayamon Stadium during the month of July flashback nine years ago. Same month, same stadium. The tragic murder of the immortal bruiser Brody and its OJ-like ending with the murderer walking free. This time it was Brody's assassin, Jose Gonzalez that felt the pain and injury. Some would call it karma. The Bible says you reap what you sow. For me, Christmas came early this year. Klon. Melbourne, Florida. Austin slash Owen Hart. The Owen Hart Steve Austin injury certainly starts one thinking. What would have happened if Austin was paralyzed? When do you drop the work, big pay-per-view show or not, and get him help? If time is critical, do you endanger his life just to keep the storyline going? With all the crazy bumps it seems like only a matter of time before someday we'll witness a big accident. That's just the odds. But will things be made worse by someone trying to not let reality enter the picture? Richard Cause. Oak Park, Illinois. Wrestling Observer Newsletter. P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009-1228. August 25, 1997.